Um, could you keep your Bibles open? Uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, page 1128. And um, you might find it helpful. There's some headings on the handout, the welcome sheet, if you want to follow along. Let me pray, and let's ask for God's help as we come to look at his word together. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together as your people on this day that you have made uh, to listen to you, the living God, speak to us. And so we pray for your spirit to be at work in our hearts, that as we hear what you're saying in this passage, that we'd understand that we would listen and that we would be obedient to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's, it's often been said, this is the greatest letter ever written. Um, quite probably the most influential thing ever written. Not that, you know, if you went out on the street this morning, you asked the people of South Sea, what do you think is the most influential thing ever? I mean, I doubt they would mention Romans. But this letter, without a doubt, has had a profound impact on the world because of its profound impact on God's people. And people like Martin Luther and the great reformer, um, he, he would have pointed to this letter of Romans. If you could have asked him, what's the, the, the thing that has been so important for you in your conversion to Christianity? He would have said, this letter of Romans. It was through reading Romans, God gripped him with the gospel. And Martin Luther went on to be the catalyst for the Reformation. And the influence of the Reformation continues today, even, even in post-Christian Britain today. If it was possible to find the book of the Bible that has had, you know, the most books written about it, or the most sermons given on it, the most time devoted to it, I think we could be certain it's, it's this book of the Bible. All the Bible is God's word, all the Bible is precious, but if every book of the Bible were a precious jewel then this book of Romans has been the, the one that God's people have come back to time and time again as one of the most beautiful. And I think that should excite us this morning as we, as we start this sermon series. You know, as we think about how God has used this book in the past to change the lives of his people, we can pray big prayers, can't we, about how God might use this book in our lives, in our church. It also means, in some ways, you know, this book of the Bible is a dangerous book to read. You could say that about any part of the Bible, actually. Um, but maybe, you know, if you want, you could get a big sign and stick it, a post-it note. Don't do it in the church Bibles, do it in your own Bible. You could stick a big post-it note at the start of the book of Romans and say, beware, can cause serious spiritual side effects. Because this book is transformational. It has been transformational. And we're going to see some of the ways Paul wants this letter to, to change us this morning. And it's radical. So beware. The opening verses that we, we've just read, they introduce this book to us. And maybe this is the part of Romans you don't know so well. You know, if you've been a Christian any length of time, I'm sure there are verses that you know well from Romans. But I doubt any of them are here in the first section, maybe verse 16. That's the, the first verse that you might um, know. But these opening verses are crucial for us because they help us to see two things. They help us to see, number one, what Paul is writing about. And, and we might think we know Romans, we might know what it's about, but I think Paul's answer might surprise us this morning. And also, number two, why he's writing this book. This book is here to do something in us. And we're going to see some of what that is this morning. Now first, um, look with me at verse one. I want you to see something very obvious um, and I've said it already, but it's so obvious that we tend to forget it when we read Romans, and it's this, that this book is a letter. It's a letter. It's from somebody to somebody. It's from Paul to Rome, and eventually to us. Um, this is heading number one, if you're, if you're following on the handout. Verse one, Paul a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Paul has written this letter. And he's written to a church. Look at verse 7. 
to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. So it's from Paul, it's two Christians in a church in Rome. And I stress that because so often Romans is read like a theological textbook, like an encyclopedia of theology. You know, Romans is the place we turn to, isn't it, when when we want to help us, we want to kind of define all those long Christian jargon words, you know, the words that all end in shun, justification, glorification, sanctification, predestination, and so on. Now, this is the book that we think of when we think of all those long words, and Romans will help us understand those long words, and, and don't get me wrong, those words are really important, and we need to understand them, and we will understand them as we go through this book. But we just need to realize as we we start the book, it's a letter. It's not a theological textbook. It's not an encyclopedia. It's from a real human being to a church. And it's been written very carefully for a specific reason. You know, Romans is a long letter. But there are so many things Paul doesn't talk about. Um, It's not a comprehensive systematic theology. Paul has chosen what he wants to include very carefully And he's left out other things, things that he talks about in other letters, but he doesn't talk about here. Look at verse 1 again. Paul, he's not just some guy, is he? He's a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, and set apart for the gospel of God, which means Paul has a, a commission from God. He's been given a job by God, personally, to proclaim the gospel. And not in the same way, you know, that you and I are called to proclaim the gospel as well. Christians are called to proclaim the gospel. But Paul is called to proclaim the gospel in a different way than than we are. He's Jesus' spokesman in a way that you and I are not. And writing this letter is part of his job, part of that that job, that task. Um, On the handout, there are just, I've put down there a few reasons under the first heading why Paul has written this letter. And I want to kind of go through them with you. I want to explain them. I want to show you how they fit together. So look down to verse 11. Paul says, firstly, he wants to strengthen this church. Verse 11, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. Now, he's not talking there, I don't think, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I don't think that's what he means by um, spiritual gift. He's saying he's been wanting to come to this church to spiritually strengthen them. He wants them to be mature, solid Christians. And I think he's talking about the same thing in verse 13. Look at verse 13. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I've had among the other Gentiles. He wants to strengthen them. He wants to have a harvest among them. Now again, he's not talking there about preaching the gospel to people who aren't Christians. He's not talking about that kind of harvest. He's talking about a harvest amongst the church, God's people in Rome. He's saying he wants to visit Rome to teach them, to strengthen them, to see the fruit of his ministry amongst them. He wants to help them grow. And he wishes he could do it in person, but he can't, so he's written this letter. Now, what sort of strengthening does Paul have in mind? What what would it look like to be strong in Paul's view? Well, you could could go and read the rest of Romans, right? You'll find out. If you read the rest of Romans, you'll find out what Paul means, especially if you read chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15. You'll you'll see lots of the implications that Paul has in mind. But chapter 1, verse 5, have a look there. Chapter 1, verse 5 is, I think, a very helpful summary Uh, Look at verse 5. In verse 5, Paul sums up the job he's been given by Jesus. He puts it like this. Through him, that's through Jesus, we, and, and the we there is Paul and the other apostles, not us. So we have received grace and apostleship. Why? To call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. Paul's job is to bring about the obedience that comes from faith amongst the Gentiles for the glory of God. He wants to bring about obedience. 
Obedience to Jesus. Not rule keeping, but a heartfelt attitude of worship of God, which involves the whole of our lives. He wants people to wholeheartedly surrender their lives to Jesus in worship and service of him. That, that's Paul's job. And, and he takes it really seriously. Look at verse 14. He says, I'm a debtor both to Greeks and, and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. He's a debtor. He's under obligation, he's saying. This is the task he's being given personally by Jesus. He wants all the nations, all the world, to bow the knee to Jesus. That's what he wants. He's not just talking about becoming a Christian. Right? The, the whole of the Christian life is a life of obedience from start to finish. It begins with obedience, recognizing Jesus as Lord, recognizing him as Savior, surrendering our lives to Jesus. That's how it begins, and it continues with obedience. We need to be clear, obedience is not legalism. Obedience is not legalism. Don't hear the word obedience and think legalism. They're very different things. Legalism is trying to gain my own righteousness, gain my own standing with God by my works. But what, what Paul's talking about here, chapter 1, verse 5, is, is living out the relationship we have with God because of what he's given us. Obedience that comes from faith. Authentic faith results in obedience. Authentic faith means an ongoing surrender of our lives to Jesus in worship and service of him. And if you read Romans, you'll, you'll see all the ways Paul expects that to, to work out. He's written this letter. He's been given a task to call all the world to serve Jesus. And he hopes this message that we're going to read over these next few weeks is going to transform this church into a people who are radically committed to Jesus. That's what he wants. And that's why this letter could contain a warning. Beware, serious spiritual consequences. And actually, here, here's the last thing. Okay, here's the last thing about why Paul's written this letter. He's written to Rome in particular. He's written to Rome. Why? Because he thinks that they can help him in this task of calling not just Rome to worship Jesus, but all the world to worship Jesus. Um, can you turn with me to the end of Romans, chapter 15, verse 23? Chapter 15, verse 23. It's page 1142. Um, do you remember in the book of Acts, um, Paul was a very busy man wasn't he? That's a bit of an understatement, isn't it? He went on quite a few missionary journeys all around the region proclaiming the gospel. And he says, chapter 15, verse 23, he says he's finished that work now. He's finished that work in all those places and he's set his sights further afield. So chapter 15, verse 23, he says, but now there is no more place for me to work in these regions. And since I've been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I get to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and that you will assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. In other words, Paul wants Rome to be like Mission HQ for the next part of his ministry in Spain. He's not looking for a holiday on the beach. He's not heading to Spain for that. He's being given a task of proclaiming the gospel to the, to the nations, and now he's set his sights on Spain. And he wants to go to Spain via Rome, and he wants this church in Rome to help him. And he's probably looking for financial support. He's probably looking for prayer. He wants them to be his partners in the gospel. And, and he's hoping that what he says in this letter is going to grip this church to the extent that they share his conviction. That everybody needs to hear about Jesus and everybody needs to bow the knee to him. So, so let's put all that together. He wants to strengthen this church to bring about their worship and obedience so that they might help him in his work of calling all the world to obedience to Jesus. Jesus. 
as well. That's what this letter's for. And that's what God wants to do in, in us. He wants to use it so that we might worship Jesus with all of our lives, that we might surrender our lives to Jesus. And in doing so, that we might share Paul's conviction that all the world needs to worship Jesus too. Maybe you could pray this week this term as we read this book. Maybe you could pray for some of those things, for yourself, for our church. Pray. Pray that God would use the book of Romans to strengthen us. Pray that God would use the book of Romans to transform us, to cause us to surrender our lives to Jesus in worship of him. Here's the question though, okay? What message would do that? What is the message that is going to achieve that aim? What message will strengthen this church, our church, you? You know, if you're feeling weary as a Christian, if you're, if you're lacking motivation, if you're struggling, if you're struggling to persevere, what is it that's going to change your convictions so that you worship Jesus with your whole life and so that you want to see everybody worship Jesus? What, what message is going to do that? Well, it's the gospel. That's what Romans is all about. It's the gospel. This is point number two uh, on, on the heading. Don't make the mistake of thinking that once you know the gospel, you don't need the gospel anymore. Paul doesn't think so. In fact, Paul thinks the gospel message is the message that continues to transform us all through our Christian lives. But Christians never ever move on from the gospel, which is why Paul spends all his time in this, in this longest book that he ever wrote explaining the gospel. It's the gospel that will strengthen us. It's the gospel that will transform us. Look at what he says about the gospel. This is in verses one to seven. What is the gospel? Um, actually, what Paul says here is, is a preview. It's a, tr- a trailer of everything he's gonna say in this letter. Look at verse one. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The, the gospel is not God's plan B. You know, as if the Old Testament was plan A, and that didn't work, so now the gospel is plan B. That's not true. The gospel was promised beforehand, Paul says, in the Old Testament. And Paul doesn't mean, he doesn't mean, you know, as you read the Old Testament, there's the occasional promise, you know, that that kind of points forward to the gospel. No, he means the whole Old Testament, all the Old Testament was pointing forward to the gospel. All the Old Testament was pointing forward to the gospel. God's plan has always been the gospel. Paul's going to prove that to us as we read Romans. He's going to show us exactly how this message of the gospel is not something he's invented. It is the way God has always worked and always been working. And we're going to see that in the coming weeks. Second thing to notice about the gospel, look at verse 3. This is really important. The gospel is about Jesus. Verse 3, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son. The gospel's about Jesus. That might sound like stating the obvious, but often when we think of the gospel, we think of, don't we think of a system? You know, we think of a series of propositions that are true that result in salvation. And we think of those long words, justification and and sanctification and glorification. The gospel, the word gospel means good news. And the good news is not about me. The good news is not about those Christian jargon words either. It's not primarily about something that has been done for me, to me. The good news is about a person. It's about Jesus. When we talk about sharing the gospel with people, you know, we, we perhaps think of that system, don't we? Maybe you think of speaking about humanity or how we need to be rescued or how we are rescued or about the future. And, and those are true things to say. I'm not, not, not saying it's not true. But Paul wants us to see the gospel first and foremost is about sharing Jesus. 
introducing somebody to Jesus. And being a Christian, and this is important as well, being a Christian is not, it is not about agreeing to the statement of faith. You know the statement of faith we have as a church? Being a Christian is not about just saying, yes, going through those nine things, and I agree with all those. Being a Christian is about knowing Jesus, trusting Jesus, serving Jesus, loving Jesus. The gospel's about him. What in particular about Jesus? What's the good news about Jesus? So let me read verse 3 and 4. Regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm sure we've spoken before about the Nike tick. You know the Nike tick? Um, Paul describes Jesus' life in that pattern of the Nike tick. Jesus, the Son of God, he took on flesh. He came down from heaven. He he took on the form of a human being. He died, and verse 4, through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Paul isn't saying, you know, it's not that Jesus wasn't the Son of God before he rose from the dead. He was the Son of God. He's the eternal Son of God. But in a sense, he was the Son of God seen in weakness. And by his resurrection, he's been declared to be the Son of God in power. The mighty, risen King. Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's what Paul says, isn't it? If you, if you want a short summary of the gospel... Someone says to you, what is the gospel? Can you tell me in four words? Here it is. Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the good news about Jesus, that he's Lord, that he's the king, that he took on flesh, he died, he, he rose, and now he reigns. The good news about Jesus is that he rules and he reigns over everybody and everything, Can you see why Paul's task is to call all the nations, without exception, to obedience to this Jesus? Jesus rules and reigns over everybody, so everybody needs to hear about him. We support the Clark family, don't we, in Sweden? This is why they've gone to Sweden. It's why people go all over the world to proclaim this message about Jesus, because he is Lord of everybody. It's why Paul is so eager to preach the gospel in Rome, to call this church to worship Jesus. It's why Paul's so eager to get to Spain, to call all the world to worship Jesus, because he's Lord of everybody. It's why we mustn't give in to that temptation to keep Jesus to ourselves. You know, the world will tell us, believe what you want in private, just don't try and tell me it's got anything to do with me. It's nice for you, it's not for me. It needs to be for everybody. Because Jesus Christ is Lord. What what Paul tells us here in verses 3 and 4 is good news. Lots of people don't think it's good news that Jesus is Lord. We're going to see later in Romans how it is good news. How these things that have happened to Jesus are actually true of us, God's people, in a sense. How we've died and we've been raised to life. And having been raised to life, we are sons of God, like Jesus, Romans 8 says. The gospel is about him. It's what God has done in Christ, and it's good news for us and for the world. It's good news because, point number three, through this message, God will save everybody who believes in Jesus. Look at verse 16. Let me uh, read. Actually, I'm going to read from verse 15. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. 
isn't that quite the opposite of us quite often? You know, we're not eager to proclaim the gospel because we are ashamed of it. It seems a bit foolish to us, maybe. It seems weak. It seems a bit silly, you know, to tell my friend about Jesus. We worry about what they're going to think or what they're going to say. Sometimes we worry about what they, they will think about the gospel. You know, Paul, Paul knew that. If you go and read 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1, Paul, Paul says, he says, people will say the gospel's foolish. They'll say it's weak. Paul knows other preachers have watered down the message of the gospel because they think it will offend people, just like people do today. He knows that temptation. Maybe sometimes we don't worry about what people will think about the gospel. We worry about what people will think of us when we tell them the gospel. And, and again, I think Paul knew that feeling. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says to the Corinthians, I brought the gospel to you with fear and trembling. Maybe sometimes we're ashamed of the gospel because we're not sure. We have doubts. Paul is going to show us in this letter of Romans why we can be confident in the gospel. Paul knows the temptation to be ashamed, but he isn't ashamed. Because he is convinced it is not a weak message. However it might seem, whatever people might say or think or feel or hear, when they, when they hear the gospel, he knows it's not a weak message. Verse 16 that is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because, because it's the power of God that brings salvation for everyone who believes. What is it that will change and transform people's lives? Where is the power of God? Is it in miracles? or signs, or wonders, or persuasive arguments, where is the power of God? It's this message about Jesus come to earth, becoming a man, dying, rising, and now reigning. Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the power of God. This message is how God will transform people's lives. It's this message that is going to rescue people. It's how God will bring people from death to life. If at Cornerstone we want people to be brought to Christ and transformed by Christ, this is the message that we need them to hear. And Paul is utterly convinced this is the way God will do it. That's why he's eager to preach the gospel. It's why he wants to go to Spain with the gospel. The gospel is God's power to save everyone who believes. Final question as we come to an end this morning. Why? Why is the gospel so powerful? Why can the gospel save everyone who believes? Well, verse 17. We don't have time to, to unpack verse 17. There's a lot we could say. We don't need to unpack verse 17 because, you know, the rest of Romans is going to unpack verse 17 for us. Verse 17 is, in a sense, the program for the rest of Romans. The gospel is so powerful, verse 17, because it reveals God's righteousness. It shows God to be utterly righteous. And it reveals a righteousness that God can give us. A righteousness that, that, that doesn't belong to us. A righteousness that we don't have ourselves. But a righteousness that we can have by faith. Faith from first to last, utterly and completely by faith, Paul says. The gospel is powerful because in the gospel there is a righteousness on offer that we desperately need. And it can be ours, not by something we do, but a gift that comes simply by, by grasping hold of it, by faith. The rest of this book is going to unpack that for us, so come back next week. Let me finish with verse 15. Look again at verse 15. Paul says, 
that is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. I wonder if we might pray this week that as we read Romans together this term, pray that we would have Paul's eagerness. Could you pray that? Could you pray that for yourself? Could you pray it for your midweek group? Could you pray that for the church? Paul is eager that, that Rome hears the gospel. C- could you pray that we'd be eager to hear the gospel? Pray that we'd be gripped by the gospel, as Paul explains it for us. Pray that we would have our convictions and our character shaped by the gospel. Could you pray that this gospel would cause us to worship Jesus at Cornerstone Church? And let's pray we'd share Paul's eagerness that other people hear the gospel as well. Let's pray that we're not going to be ashamed of the gospel, but that we will be convinced of the power of the gospel and eager to be part of that work that the whole world would come to know the gospel as well. Let's pray for, for Paul's that we'd have Paul's eagerness, eagerness to hear it ourselves, eagerness that others would hear it too. Why don't I pray that for us now?